Your presenters today are Mark Alexandra Nickner and Adam Roy. Mark is a senior product manager responsible for screening technologies at Valmet. He holds a mechanical engineering bachelor's degree from Université du Québec à Trois-Rivières. Mark started his career with AFT Aikawa Group as a process engineer for Wedgewire screen cylinder products. He has 14 years of experience with nine years in screening as a process engineer, product manager, and now senior production manager. He is involved in equipment and system sizing, installations, startup and commissioning, troubleshooting, energy saving projects, and quality improvement. Adam is a process engineer for screening. Adam holds a mechanical bachelor engineering degree from the University of Quebec at Chicoutimi. He has 12 years of experience in the pulp and paper industry with much of his career as a reliability engineer and mechanical superintendent at a dissolving pulp mill. For the last five years, he's worked in screening technology for Valmet. He also has good knowledge of machine condition monitoring, lubrication, vibration analysis, thermography, ultrasound, and he is a certified machinery lubrication technician. Mark is going to start off with an overview and discussion of screening basics. He will continue by looking at balances, rotor technologies, and process control. The last section of the webinar will cover the dual excluder, a unique protection screen which your Cinus system could benefit from. Finally, he will discuss how to partner with Velmet to maximize screening performance. After his presentation, we'll allow 10 to 15 minutes of time for questions and answers. Good afternoon, everyone and uh, good morning for the ones located, located on the West Coast. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar. Uh, we're gonna start with the basic principles of screening. We screen pulp mainly to uh, remove uh, foreign contaminants. The foreign contaminants either comes from the furnish or from the process of making the pulp, like in chemical pulping, cooking, is not a perfect process and will leave some contaminants such as knots and shapes. The screening will affect different things such as the paper product, the uh, paper properties, the, the pulp itself. It will affect as well the, the yield of the process and can affect some uh, costs like the bleaching cost. At 95%, all the pressure screen existing and installed in the world share uh, common similarities. They consist of a pressurized housing uh, with a stationary screen cylinder. The housing will have an inlet, accept nozzle, and reject nozzle. The stationary screen cylinder that we see here in orange is the filtering element. Many of those housing uh, will also have what we call a junk trap to remove some tramp material. They will all also be equipped with what we call the screen rotor, which is there to keep the screen cylinder from blinding during the filtering process. So basically, we will pump stock through the screen. This pulp will contain some contaminants, debris like shives. The stock will go between the rotor and the screen cylinder. The good fiber, which is smaller than the aperture size of the screen cylinder, will go forward. The debris will concentrate, go down, and exit by the rejects. So we'll have a concentration of debris and pulp. Here is just a slide to give an overview of what looks like rotors and cylinder. On the top here, we do have what we call drum rotors. At the bottom, we have a foil rotor. These can be uh, used in similar application, but will behave differently. On the right, we do have some different type of screen cylinders. We have wedge wire screen cylinders, here a rebuildable version, and here a non-rebuildable version. That's just to give you an overview of what it looks like inside the screen. So to screen the pulp, we do have different options. We can screen with perforation or slots. There are two different types of slotted screen cylinder. There are mill slot and wedge wire screen cylinder. Today's standard is the wedge wire. Back in the days, we used to work with mill slot, 
which consists of a flat plate that is milled with very narrow saw and then rolled. This used to be less expensive for a while, but nowadays with the massive production of wedge wire product, the mill slot is not competitive anymore on a price point of view. So it's not very common to use mill slotted screen in different applications. The drilled screen cylinder are still used today, although it's an old technology. Uh, there is some benefit to it. It's lower cost. Also, it will have less tendency to wear due to uh, abrasive material like sand. And it will also give a good visual aspect on a dirt count point of view. We still use drilled screen cylinder in approachable screen, broke coarse uh, screening, and eye kappa pulp. But today's standard is the uh, wedge wire. And there is quite a lot of benefits to the wedge wire. First is that for the same screening area, we can achieve more open area, so we can get more capacity out of a single screen. Part of the reason is that the slot is continuous on all the screening height of the screen. Uh, we can also manufacture those screens with very, very narrow and precise slot, as small as four tau. It provides as well a more uniform flow. And when we talk about recycled fine screen or bleachable grade, that's the product to go with. So if you have older screen rooms uh, that are still operating holes or mill slot uh, on bleachable grade or OCC, uh, the wedge wire is a good solution to uh, increase capacity. And when you have more capacity, you can reduce energy or you can use uh, smaller slots to have a better pulp quality. Holes and slot will behave uh, differently on a, sc a screening point of view. When you screen, there are two different mechanisms. The first mechanism is what we call barrier screening. So barrier screening is when the debris is bigger than the aperture size. So the debris cannot make its way through the slot or the holes and is not accepted, is then rejected. There is another mechanism which is called probability screening. That's when the debris is smaller than the aperture and it might or might not go through. And what will make the difference are different factors, such as the reject rate, the passing velocity, and the uh, technology used, such as the screen cylinder uh, design or the rotor design. Uh, but by definition with holes, the holes are always bigger than the, the slots in size. So there will be a larger part of uh, probability screening when you use holes. And the end result is that holes will accept more debris by weight. The other uh, one of the advantage of the slotted screen cylinder is that you depend less on the reject rate you operate on your screen to get a certain efficiency because most of the efficiency comes from the barrier screening coming from the fine slot. We find screen in many different systems, and most of the time, they will come as multiple units. Over here, we have a brown stock system with a screen room that has three stages. We want to minimize the amount of fiber loss, so we're adding many stages. Over here, we have iKappa pulp, which will usually use one stage or two stage of screening. Over here, recycle, which usually use multiple stages, and mechanical pulping will also use one or two stages of screening. Uh, in most of the case, the primary stage involve multiple unit. Now, let's go through some balances. So let's look at this three-stage reverse cascade. It is called the reverse cascade arrangement because the accept of the lower stage are going back to feed the primaries, the, the stage above. So over here, we have the accept of our secondary stage going back to feed the primary. And here we have the accept of the tertiary stage being mixed with the reject of the primary to feed the secondary. So the only pulp going forward to the next process 
is the exit of the primaries. That's where comes most of the efficiency of the screen room. So we have a screen room of 1,000 tons per day with five tons of debris in it. So it's about half a percent concentration of debris. We feed that to the screen room. Our goal is obviously to minimize the quantity of shives or debris that will go forward to have the best pulp quality as possible or the required quality. But at the same time, we want to have a good yield and we want to minimize the amount of fiber that will be rejected out of the system. So there are different ways to evaluate the efficiency of our screen room. We can calculate the cleanliness efficiency, which will be comparing the concentration of debris accepted by the screen room with the concentration of debris going to the screen room. So that's going to be 1 minus 0.035 divided by 0.5 which will give us a cleanliness efficiency of 93. How much cleaner is the accept compared to the feed of the screen room? We can also evaluate the efficiency of that screen room by looking at the mass reject efficiency. Now we would be comparing how much tons of debris we reject out of the system compared to the tons that came in the system. In this case, 4.6 divided by 5 will give 92% mass reject efficiency. So uh, let's talk about reject rates. When we have a certain amount of reject entering the screen, like 1%, we need to reject a certain amount of pulp out of that stage. If the debris content increase at 10%, we need to reject more you have to expect rejecting more. So the reject rate of a single stage needs to be adjusted according to the quantity of incoming shives or debris to that stage. Of course, if you reject more by flow or by weight, you will send more fibers in the rejects. However, you need to reject more than the amount of debris there is if you want to reject as much debris as possible. And if you don't reject more than the amount of debris entering a single stage, this will lead to some operational issues. The screen will blind, the interlocks will trigger and will flush. The efficiency at that stage and in the screen room will be lower. And worst case, the debris that will be retained in the screen room will wear the components like the cylinder, and the rotor and wearing these components will bring you back to the first issue the screen will just blind more there'll be more flushing and the efficiency is just going to get worse so on the next slide we're going to see how the balance of a screen room should be changed if the debris coming in the system suddenly increase for any reason the furnish is dirtier you add some cooking issues in the digester and you expect more shives. We're gonna see how this needs to be changed. So here is our same three-stage balance. We do have, again, a tonnage of 1,000 ton per day with five tons per day of debris, which consists of half a percent debris. So out of the primary stage, we will reject a number of 11% reject rate by weight, okay? So this will concentrate the debris, half a percent, by a factor of nine, and it's gonna be mixed with the accept of the tertiary screen to result in a debris content feeding the secondary screen of 3.5%. So out of this, we need to reject from that stage much more than we did reject from the primary stage. We will reject from that stage about 17%. This will again concentrate the debris by a factor of roughly six to bring it at 20% feeding the tertiary screen. Then we need again from that screen to reject more by weight than we did at the secondary screen. 
we will reject about 30% by weight. This will result with a total reject in tons of seven tons per day out of the system relative to 1,000 tons per day production. However, 4.6% are debris. So we have 2.4% of good fibers, which represent 0.25% of the total system feed, which is not too bad. What happens if this number here, half a percent, goes up to 1%? Well, if we just look here, we're gonna, at 1%, we're gonna have 10 tons per day of debris. On the previous balance, the total reject was seven tons per day. Already there, something does not match. If we leave the system as it was, some debris won't be rejected. So we have 1% ton per day of debris. The concentration, we will run a reject rate on the primary slightly above, okay, only 1% more than in the previous cases because we have slightly more debris. The concentration feeding the secondary will double compared to the previous balance. So we need to reject more out of that secondary stage. We'll reject about 20% by weight. Then this will concentrate the debris to the tertiary screen at 31%. We'll have to reject more from that tertiary screen. So in the end, we will reject about 12 and a half tons per day, but three quarter of it will be debris. The fiber loss total for the system will still be minimal. If this kind of number is not acceptable, we can fine tune the screen room, or we can add one more stage to try to recover fiber. And this additional stage, there, there are different equipment to be uh, installed for that additional stage. So, what you need to do when you want to balance your screen room to adjust your reject rate. You need to test for shives and consistency coming at the feed of each screening stage. And then for each stages, you want to reject 10% more than the percentage of shive coming in. So if I have 5% shives coming or 5% debris coming to my screen, I will want to reject 15% by weight and how to measure your reject rate by weight. You sample uh, your reject line, take the consistency, and then calculate the tons with the flow that was processed during the sampling time. You want to adjust the reject rate all together because one will have an impact on the others. Then once you are close to a good reject rate adjustment, you can fine tune the last stage to really try to minimize the amount of fiber loss in that last stage without compromising the operation of that last screen or the components like you don't want that to wear prematurely due to a low reject rate. Now let's talk about rotors. There are quite many different technologies of rotors available on the market. The one that you see on the screens are Valmet rotor and they are also suited for different applications. Within the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a flavor of the week when talking about rotors, and it's been energy and efficiency. But there are many other factors that needs to be taken into consideration. First, energy. The energy needs to be looked at in terms of specific energy. How much power do you consume relative to the tonnage of pulp you are processing? There is also the wear that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, there are different applications out there. Depending on the furnish, there are more or less abrasive contaminants. And the design of rotor you choose will have a big impact on the wear of some components in the screen. You also need to look at the pulsation mechanism of the rotor. This will affect the capacity of the screen, but will also affect its ability to overcome some cooking upset condition or any kind of controls issue or issues with the furnish. There are also many different brands of screen, uh, pressure screen out there. Some 
have big diameters uh, and are very short. Others can have small diameters and are tall. This is what we call the aspect ratio of the screen. And this will have a big impact on the thickening inside the screen. And you might want to take that into consideration to choose the right rotor that will provide you less thickening in the screen. Let's first look at defining uh, the screen capacity based on a certain rotor technology. Over here, we do have a uh, chart showing the capacity of a given rotor. On the Y axis, we have the accept flow through a single screen in cubic meters per hour. On the X axis, we have the feed consistency of the pulp to that screen. And all those multiple curves are tonnage curve matching the junction of flows and consistency. So if I feed a screen at 3% consistency and I accept 400 cubic meters per hour, I'm going to have a production in tons through that screen of 300 tons per day. Any screen will be limited by different factors. First, it's the hydraulic limit. Given a certain size of screen and the specification of the screen cylinder inside, it will have an hydraulic limit. You cannot process more flow through that screen. And there'll be another limiting factor, which will be the blinding limit. And the blinding limit is mainly governed by the rotor design. So any type of rotor, any design will have a curve similar to that. But depending on the way the rotor is designed and how the pulsation element works, this line will be at a different elevation. It will move. So the rotor can have an impact on this blinding limit. The blinding limit is really how good is the rotor to clean the screen plate and prevent it from blinding. So the rotor technology will have an impact on that curve, but also the speed you operate the rotor. So if you want to have more capacity for a single screen, you can speed up the rotor and this line will move in that direction, providing more capacity in the high consistency range. And if you want to save energy because you have more screening capacity than you need, you can reduce the speed and the rotor will save you power, but will also give you less capacity. So the shape of the rotor will impact the capacity, the power consumption, the screening efficiency, the thickening and the wear. But the speed you operate that given rotor will have an effect on the same parameters. In the next few slides, we will look more in detail to those three parameters. Now let's look at the capacity versus the power. We have another other chart that will show three different rotor technology. On the left, we do have the capacity on the left uh, Y axis. On the right Y axis, we have the power consumption. And on the X axis, we have the rotor tip speed. The tip speed is really the speed of the foil element of the rotor relative to the stationary screen cylinder. So for a given rotor H at low speed in the range of 18, we have almost no capacity. But as we speed up that rotor, the capacity increase a lot because of the strength of the pulsation element and the way the rotor is designed. For a given tip speed, the rotor will consume a certain amount of power. If we compare it to another rotor that is lower energy rotor, this rotor L will pretty much have the same power consumption based on the same tip speed, okay? Both power are the same. At high speed, will have less capacity, but at lower speed, will still give a good amount of capacity. At 28 meters per second, they both have the same capacity and they will consume the same power. If we want to save power and reduce the speed on a single screen, and we reduce the speed on both at 23 meters per second, they will consume the same power, but one rotor will give 12.5 capacity and the other one will give seven and a half. So at that speed, the rotor L is much more efficient on a specific point of view. 
They consume the same power, but one can process more pulp through it. Now let's look at the difference between uh, the L rotor and another type of rotor that is very low energy rotor. The A rotor, which for any given speed would consume much less power than the L rotor. But if at the same time, less power, there's a big relation between power consumption and capacity. And at the same time, this rotor will provide less capacity for that lower production. And if we compare apple to apple, both rotors, the A rotor will consume much less. But when you compare the capacity, there is much less capacity as well, which result in, you can save 20% power by using a low energy rotor. But in terms of tons per day, you lose 24. So on a specific energy point of view, you did not gain anything. So it's really important to compare a rotor technology in terms of specific energy. And this will lead us to look at a case of a screen room. Let's assume that we have a fiber line of 1200 tons per day, and then we operate four primary screen with very, very old technologies like bump rotors, which came in like the 60s. All of those screens consume 150 HP. The total primary screen consumes 600 HP. We have an opportunity here to reduce the power of that screen room significantly and save energy every year, thus save money. So we're gonna put better rotor technology and drop the speed to save 40 HP per screen. This is major, you know, it's gonna provide 26% energy saving. However, if you look at the situation in terms of energy, that's what you would do if you only think about the energy. If you think about the specific energy per tons, there is another way you can tune that screen room. You could use that same new rotor technology and derate it in speed, but not as much as in the first case, halfway so that it consume 130 HP. At 130 HP, that screen will have more capacity than it had with the old rotor technology. Thus, you can operate three screens instead of four. This will bring you to a specific energy, much lower per tons. You will save 10% more on energy, but you'll have the advantage of saving spare parts on the screen that you shut down. And this screen will also be an inline spare which can potentially save you some production losses and downtime. And production uh, losses and downtimes uh, very often will have much more value than saving a few percent of energy along the year. Now let's look at rotor wear. There are different things to look at in the design of a rotor that can impact the wear depending on the type of contaminants you have. The clearance with the screen cylinder is one important thing. Clearance will vary between 60 tau and 300 tau, and this will have an impact since some contaminants can get pinched between the rotating element and the screen cylinder and damage this one. The shape of the uh, rotor element will also have a big impact. Many rotors out there have rounded leading edge, and these are pinch point with the screen cylinder. If there's a pea gravel that gets stuck between the rotor and the screen cylinder, it gets pinched and will groove and damage both components. There are quite a few rotors out there that are square leading edge, which reduce the wear between the rotor and the screen cylinder. The foil layout will also have an impact. Different foil layout will generate a different flow pattern in the screen, and uh, those flow patterns will concentrate the debris in some specific area and will wear uh, the components inside the screen. Over here on those two pictures, we have two different rotors that operate in the same application and the same screen, same mill. They have a very different wear rate. This one is much more worn, and that's due to the flow pattern in the screen, due to the rotor. You also need to look at the material. Some rotors out there are only made out of 300 series stainless steel. Others will be uh, hardened stainless steel, and some other will be chrome. There are even some rotors for very high wear application that will be 
a combination of those two. Then the speed. We've uh, talked about the fact that the speed can increase the capacity, but the speed will also have an effect on the wear. The faster the rotor goes, the more wear you will have on the rotor and the screen cylinder. Other thing to look for is the manufacturing quality, the specification of the rotor itself. And uh, one way to look at that is simply as looking at the balancing weight. This is a typical balancing weight inside the skirt of a drum rotor. Here, it's more of an improved design. And you can see that the uh, uh, manufacturing quality of the rotor is better because the weight is much smaller. So the way it was manufactured, initially the rotor was more balanced than in the previous case. And here, this is something really unacceptable. Uh, it means that uh, when the rotor was manufactured, it was not round and uh, they needed to machine the outside to make it round. This make the external wall of the drum to vary in thickness. It makes it very unbalanced. So they have to put big weights on it to be balanced. As the weights will wear, you have quite high risk of having an unbalanced rotor and then damage internal components in your screen, such as a cylinder and the rotor. Now let's talk about an issue that we commonly see in pulp mill, and, and that issue is sand recirculation. On that picture, we can see uh, why 50 years ago, the sand was not an issue in pulp mill. The logs were literally being washed in the river. So no sand was coming in the pulp mill. But today, there is a lot of sand that comes with the logs or the chips because of the way the wood is being uh, taken. So the sand will uh, generally vary between 8 tau and 50 tau, and it will be something very abrasive for some components in the pulp mill. Back in the day, most of the screen rooms were also designed with holes or quite large slots. Holes will accept nearly all the sand it will go forward and it won't be rejected by the screen. It will just be rejected in proportion since you split the flow in the reject and the accept. Fine slots though in a screen will reject nearly all the sand and that contribute to a big issue in some system. If we go back to that three-stage reverse cascade, every day a small quantity of sand will enter the screen room and the fine slot will be concentrated by the primary screen. Go to the secondary screen where the fine slot will reject again the sand and concentrate it. Then this will be pumped to the tertiary, which will also have fine slot and concentrate the sand to quite a high level. Then in many system or screen room, the uh, shives exiting the screen room are recirculated or we try to drain those shive and recover some liquor or some fibers. And any type of drainer at the tailing end of the screen room will use either wide slots or holes. And this drainer will accept the sand. This will lead into what we call the sand recirculation. So the sand will be accepted by the drainer and will be returned to the tertiary screen. And sand will accumulate in that loop to quite a high level until it wears out the tertiary screen component. And this one will let go some sand in the stage above and the story will continue. Secondary and primary will wear. This will create you operational issues. This will cost you a lot of money in wear. The sand equal high wear on your screen cylinder and high wear on the screen cylinder involves quality issue, but also involves money because you have to change your cylinder quite often. So the solution to that is to install a sand cleaner. It should be part of any screen room operating fine slots. We want the cleaner to be on the feet of the tertiary because we are at low consistency and at low consistency, it is easier to separate by centrifugal force the sand from the fiber from the pole. By having the sand cleaner here, we break the loop and then we maintain our screen cylinder and rotor for a longer period of time without the need to change those. Here's an example of a sand cleaner that uh, I started two years ago. There are two on the line. One is there for spare. 
I said that uh, usually we want it on the feet of the tertiary screen but it is not mandatory. It can be uh, somewhere else in the tailing system depending on the configuration of your system. Another thing you can do if you don't have a sand cleaner at the moment is you can use the junk trap of your pressure screen. In the lower stage like tertiary uh, and secondary stage, the consistency is low enough that those junk trap can remove coarse sand. It won't remove the fine sand, but still you can remove some coarse sand that looks like this. This is the exit of a junk trap in a pulp mill. For the end, the rest of time, we won't go into the details of uh, controls, but here is a typical control around one pressure screen. As we've seen before, pressure screens uh, are always in a system. There'll be multiple units. The controls must interact together. It is very common that screening issues could be related with the way the controls are programmed. Uh, so if you have any issue with your controls, you can reach to us and we can help you. There are also many screen rooms out there that does not have a modern control system. There are a lot of benefits to have those additional control. Uh, you can run your screen room with more efficiency. Uh, you can have an idea of when your components are worn and you can also run your screen room to the max of its capacity when you have the proper controls. That covers the part for optimizing screening performance. I would like to introduce a fairly new product for Valmet. It's called the Dual Excluder. It's a unique device. It's a unique type of pressure screen that was designed as a poly screen to do similar application as a high consistency cleaner and magnetic trap. The objective with the dual excluder is really to remove some trend material, baling wires, tiles, uh, nuts, bolts. It's meant to protect equipment from foreign contaminants in a process where in theory, there should not be contaminants, but there are like Bailing wire, you have a dewiring machine at your pulper, but it's not a perfect system. Once in a while, bailing wire will go in the pulper and will hit those refiner plates. So you want the dual extruder to be before those equipment to protect refiner plates, to protect cleaner cones or protect cleaners from plugging. In a cleaner plant, when a few cleaners get plugged because of some big contaminants, it makes the cleaner system to be unbalanced and reduce the efficiency of this one. The dual excluder operates with intermittent rejects, so the fiber loss is very minimal. And there is quite a lot of benefit to that dual excluder. It's a positive production compared to, let's say, an HD cleaner. So we really have a mechanical barrier it's very low energy consumption. I will, on the next slide, I will show the motor size for the amount of uh, production rate it can operate. It can uh, reach up to 6% consistency operation, which is very high for a pressure screen. It's compact, small, easy to install. It's very a neat solution for many applications to protect equipment. So we have four different models, and here's a table showing their capacity in terms of flow and production based on 4% consistency uh, with 80 tau slots, which is the size of slot we mainly use for bailing wire. And then for other application like cleaner productions, we use holes. So we can see that one unit can process quite a high production for a very low power, 30 HP for 800 tons per day, that's very low. And you can produce more if you operate at higher consistency, five to six, that production through the screen will be higher because the screen is mainly flow dependent. So the typical application will be in stock prep area to protect refiners, broke system, tissue mill. Here's the uh, testimonial from a customer. They have the wiring machine to prevent baling wire from going in the pulper, but still there was some baling wire going in the process, damaging refiner plate. And after installing the dual extruder, they went uh, refiner segment refurbishing from six months to two and a half year. So that's quite very nice result. You know, that's quite a big improvement. So that covers it all. If you have any question on screening, whether it is a chemical pulping or stock preparation or on the dual extruder, don't hesitate to reach to, to us, to anyone on that slide. 
this contact information will be available in the PDF that will be sent to you. Uh, there's myself and Adam Roy. We also have Brian Gallagher, 35 plus year experience in screening. Brian really likes to help people understanding screening. So don't hesitate to reach to him. Uh, we also have Tony Sikora, more than 30 years experience in screening, specifically in stock prep and recycle. So don't hesitate to reach those people. If you need any help for a screening audit, that's something we can provide on site or remotely. Uh, there are some customers out there for whom we are the um, screen cylinder and rotor supplier uh, with whom we do have some um, make and all agreement where we keep uh, cylinders and rotors in stock. And part of that agreement, we provide one visit per year free of charge to audit the system or give training uh, to people. So don't hesitate to reach to us. Uh, and thank you very much for listening to that presentation. Thank you for that excellent presentation, Mark. And bring us to the Q&A session. Before we get into the Q&A portion of this webinar, let me say that this presentation is available in PDF form. We've already had a few people asking for it via questions. So simply email mark at mark-alexandre.nickner at valmet.com or adam at adam.roy at valmet.com and they'll be happy to send you a copy. We've received a fair number of questions already, but you can still submit them during the Q&A period. I can see some coming up right now. If Mark and Adam cannot answer them today because they need more information or the question deals with confidential matters, they'll be sure to email you a comprehensive answer after the webinar. Mark, Adam, take it away for Q&A. Good. Okay. So uh, the first question is, what type of device would you recommend to recover additional fiber after a third stage screening on bleachable grade? Well, there can there is, uh, there is different... Uh, kind of uh, equipment out there that can uh, fulfill uh, uh, fiber recovery uh, at, in last uh, screening stage. Uh, there are um, different kind of inclined screw, uh, like uh, in Valmet, we have the uh, TS screen, uh, where you will recover some fibers by uh, uh, screening with holes, and you will drain the shive to uh, about 8% consistency. Uh, another option, as I said earlier, could be to um, add one more stage screening. If you don't care about the um, uh, the liquor that you're rejecting out of the screening room, so you could have one additional stage and maybe use slightly larger slots on that stage to recover more fiber. If you care about the liquor, you could add a fourth stage of screening and a small screw press which would bring the consistency out of the screen room in the range of 25%. So you would recover fibers and liquor. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, what is the purpose of the slots in uh, your rotors? We've seen uh, on one of the rotors that there was a, a slot on the slide between the uh, foil elements. The purpose of that slot is to bypass a part of the flow inside the rotor. It's a design that we have patented about five years ago, and it's all of us to um, maximize the production rate for larger screen size. And uh, another effect that it has is that it's uh, minimize the uh, thickening effect inside the screen because we bring some lower consistency uh, pulp from the, the feed back to the middle of the screening zone. Uh, there is a question. Do you recommend the same equipment for primary, secondary, and tertiary stages? Most of the time, we will uh, recommend the same uh, family of screen, but they will be a uh, different size. The typical uh, way to uh, size the screen room is mainly to go, uh, the secondary stage will be roughly one third of the primary stage in, um, in screening area. And then the tertiary stage will be one third the screening area of the secondary. So I would say that typically it ends up being like three primaries of a certain size, one secondary of the same size as the primary, and then a smaller tertiary. And the benefit of that is you share some spare part compatibilities between the secondary and the tertiary. 
do you have a screen for below 1% consistency at uh, 700 tons per day? Uh, yes, we do have screens for that. Uh, maybe we should, uh, we should discuss that uh, in parallel that I believe at 1% consistency, I feel this would be more like for an approach flow uh, uh, application. Uh, other than the re removing debris uh, from the pulp, can the type quality of the screen process affect other pulp properties? Uh, sure, uh, the screen will, uh, especially like in mechanical pulping, the screen will have an effect on the fractionation, rejecting the long fibers, accepting uh, shorter fibers. Uh, and in any kind of screening process, the screen will have a tendency to reject longer fiber and accept shorter fiber. So in some, uh, in different application, it's a good thing. It, in other application, it's, uh, it's not a good thing because it makes the freeness vary. It could impact uh, the washers and, and different things. But uh, yeah, the screen does not only affect the pulp quality, it does affect some properties uh, of that pulp. Can the new equipment presented be used in a recycle line? between the stock chest from the pulper and the primary slotted screen. I think a uh, questioner there is also saying, adding to that, taking into account that you have debris and also plastic material. When they're saying the new equipment, I think they're talking about the dual extruder. So I will insert in regarding this. The dual extruder is really a poly screen. Uh, you cannot operate it in, a, in an environment where there would be a very, very high level of contaminant because it works with intermittent rejects. We, we have one application in the OCC, but it's after the OCC screening system to protect a disperser. The disperser was damaged by tiles falling from a tank that is not in good condition, and the customer wanted to protect his disperser. So the screen was pulped and should not contain any uh, tramp material, but because of the tank, sometimes it does. So it's really a poly screen. Do you have any application in which bleach plant washer effluent is screened to recover fiber? Yes, we do. For that, we use uh, our IQ fiber saver, which is uh, which really looks like a IQ fine screen or a sentry sorter, but it has a different rotor technology and a different screen cylinder. And we use it to uh, recover fiber in the bleach plant out of the filtrate that is going to the effluent. Who would be able to do a process energy audit? Well, we uh, are able to do a process and energy audit. We can help you in that. Uh, the people that you've seen in the contact list uh, can support you. Uh, so you can reach, reach to us. It can be done. Uh, uh, from distance, maybe right now because of the COVID, but uh, it's very common for us to go in pulp mill and do some um, uh, some audit on systems. There's one question, and now that GLV and Valmet are all one happy family, what is the dominant screen platform uh, you are moving forward with? Well, at the moment, we are keeping uh, all technologies available and uh, because they have some advantages uh, in different kind of application. So, of course, there is some old technologies that, that we are not promoting anymore, like, uh, well, silico screens or, or very, uh, or temple pink screens. Uh, but for the, uh, like the IQ uh, and the Delta screen, we are still promoting both. Uh, they have uh, their good usage in different type of application. But uh, you know, every every month, we we are working on developing and merging technology to have a, to, to to be able to offer the, the best the best screening technology in the market. Okay. In the interest of time, we didn't get to quite all of the questions. I think some are going to have to take a little bit more discussion internally before we can answer. But I hope we're able to respond to most, if not all, of your questions. If not, Mark and Adam will follow up via email with anyone yep. whose question we were unable to answer. We'll also be emailing you a link to the recorded webinar as soon as it's available on YouTube.
If you have any further questions, email them to Mark and Adam or reach out to them at LinkedIn and they can go more in depth with you about any screening needs you may have. We hope you've gained some valuable knowledge about optimizing your screening performance today that can help move your mill forward. Thank you for giving us your time today and we hope you'll join us at future Valmet webinars. Bye-bye.